Good evening. Welcome again to the last of our six midweek Lenten services for this Wednesday as we continue with our series on the Eyes on Jesus series. We, uh, we conclude our Wednesdays this evening looking at Jesus as he is seen by Pontius Pilate and the Roman soldiers. During these 40 days of Lent, we have used the metaphor of eyesight to examine how the various people in Mark's Gospel view Jesus during his passion, that we may look within ourselves as people of faith in our day. How are we like or unlike the people who saw Jesus in the flesh? Today we learn of Pilate's worldly view and how to keep his position and placate the Jewish leaders and crowd, he handed Jesus over for crucifixion. The soldiers saw the opposite of a worldly king, but their ironic hailing of him as king of the Jews proclaimed who he really is. The world looks for power and glory. God's way is suffering and the cross. <clears throat> Which way do we look in the daily decisions we make. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and repents of evil. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God, and one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and in deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Therefore I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Our first reading is taken from Isaiah 13. Isaiah foretells punishment for the world's wickedness. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not 
give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of arrogance, and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from the second chapter of 1 John. For John tells us we must choose between the things of this world and the will of God. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride in possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our third reading is taken from the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus contrasts his kingdom with that of Pilate and the world. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Though we have not seen him, we love him. Though we do not now see him, we believe in him and rejoice with joy. Fight the good fight of the faith. Though we have not seen him, we love him. Though we do not now see him, we believe in him and rejoice with joy. Today, as we look at the events of our Lord's Passion through the eyes of some of the people who witnessed it, we find ourselves speaking the words of the chief priests and the soldiers, the groups that called for Jesus' execution, and ironically called him king. The Passion of our Lord, according to St. Mark, the 15th chapter. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes, and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And they bound him, or delivered him to Pilate, and Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in an insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, 
then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisted together a crown of thorns, and put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. So far, we have looked at the way many have looked at Jesus during this Lenten season. We have seen the disciples looking with misjudging eyes at what Jesus was doing and what the women who anointed his feet did. We have seen the, the Peter, James, and John looking at Jesus through sleepy eyes in the Garden of Gethsemane. We have seen the betraying eyes of Judas as he turned Jesus over to the Jews. The denying eyes of Peter in the courtyard during Jesus' trial. And the murderous eyes of the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, as they plotted and put together the death of Jesus. Today we look at another group, a group that have worldly eyes toward Jesus, Pilate and the Roman soldiers. Pilate, the governor of Judea, a pragmatic man, a man who didn't care for the Jews at all. In fact, he had had several run-ins with them, and they were just a thorn in his side. He didn't care about them, and he sure didn't care about Jesus, if he even knew who Jesus was at this time. Couldn't care less. His job was to keep the peace, and the situation he found himself in was escalating almost to the point of there could be a riot happening. And he didn't need a riot. Because, you see, Pontius Pilate, though he was the governor and had the power of Rome behind him, the situation was a little precarious. As I said, he had had run-ins with the Jews before. They had been a thorn in his flesh. And at least two other times, his decisions connected with the Jewish activity had been overturned by the emperor. The Jews were not hesitant of sending off a messenger and complaining to Caesar. About Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate received his power because he was of a special class of power within Rome. A group of people who were known as the Friends of Caesar. It was like a little enclave of people that Caesar felt he could trust. They had done things for Caesar that made him notice them as valued allies. They even had a ring that identified them as friends of Caesar. But over these 
these other encounters with the Jews. Pilate's standing as a friend of Caesar had been going downhill. Couldn't he handle these Jews? Didn't he know how to be Caesar's appointed governor there? When the Jews told Caesar, if you let Jesus go, you are no friend of Caesar's. Pilate knew what they were saying. You don't do this, and we're going to complain to Caesar again, and you could lose your position as a friend of Caesar. This could be the final straw. The problem for Pilate was there was only one way to lose the ring. Caesar would take it off of your dead body. Pilate, the man who was pragmatic, the man who didn't care for the Jews and probably didn't even know Jesus, suddenly found himself in a very difficult situation. And as a Roman, he approached it not from a spiritual perspective, but he saw the situation and he saw Jesus strictly from a worldly perspective. You see, he had to keep his position. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He knew that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish leaders were bringing Jesus there because they were jealous of him and afraid of his power and his popularity. And yet, he was willing to bend justice for his own sake. After all, what was one more life more or less. And so he condemns him to death. Turns him over to the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers didn't know Jesus from Adam either. All they saw was just another prisoner sentenced to death. They had had to deal with literally hundreds of such people. His sentence was, he was king of the Jews. He didn't look like a king. His tattered clothes, his beaten face, his timidity, he was not like any king they had ever encountered. There was nothing royal or regal about this man who they drive away. He looked like nothing but a weak, beaten nobody. And so they did what they usually do with prisoners sentenced to death. They make it as difficult on him as possible. They make fun of him. They mock him. They humiliate him. And they beat him. Some prisoners never made it to crucifixion. The beating killed them first. Jesus survived all that they would give to him. The crown of thorns and all of it. And they would lead him away to crucify him. In the same way they had done that for hundreds before Jesus. He was nobody special. He was just another man sentenced to death. They were looking at Jesus both Pontius Pilate and the soldiers, strictly with worldly eyes. They had a worldly point of view, they had a job to do, and they did it. And that was it.
how contrasting is Jesus as he goes through all of this, as he endures the worldly eyes of Pilate and the soldiers. Because you see, Jesus had a different set of eyes. Jesus was looking at all of these events through spiritual eyes, not worldly eyes. His spiritual eyes saw the sin of mankind, the sin of Pilate, the sin of these soldiers. And his spiritual eyes knew that something had to be done with sin. And that sin meant suffering and death. And in order to save, yes, even Pilate and the Roman soldiers, to say nothing of the Jews that brought him to Pilate for execution, and all the people of the world, as Jesus looked at them with spiritual eyes and saw their sin and their need for a Savior, he could look beyond the suffering. He could look beyond the pain. He could look beyond even the cross itself, knowing what all of that would mean for him, but all of what that would mean for you and me, for all humanity. Jesus willingly endured it all because his eyes were fixed on more than just worldly things. His eyes were fixed on the goal, the spiritual goal of the forgiveness of sins, of salvation and eternal life for all humanity. That's what was important. And that made everything else fall into place. And Jesus willingly allowed himself to be condemned, to be beaten and humiliated, to be crucified. Because his spiritual eyes were looking at our salvation rather than his own comfort. You see, what we have here is two contrasting worldviews. How we look at things. How we look at the things that are in this world. How we look at ourselves. How we look at the circumstances in which we find ourselves in life. There is a worldly worldview. When we, all if we see is the things of this world. Our interest is in things. It's in power. It's in riches or prestige or pleasure or whatever. But it's a worldview that is wrapped up only in what we can see and experience here on this earth. As a very self centered worldview. A worldview of self determination. What is best for me? It's a worldview of self truth. Whatever is right for me, Pilate, for himself, whatever was right, and if he had to bend justice to make sure that he kept his position, if he had allowed, had to allow one more individual to die, then so be it. That was his truth for his life. He could pray on the weak. He could blame others. He could bend things in his own mind to satisfy himself. That's a worldly worldview. And we see that happening all of the time around us, don't we? We even do it ourselves. We may know what God's will is, but that doesn't quite fit our situation and we're ready to bend the commandments for whatever we want. <laughs> I 
We get a lot of that from political speeches today, don't we? People bending the truth in a way that shows them in the best light. Or how about people today, for their own purposes, trying to figure out what's best for them, to be a man or a woman, to declare themselves male or female, despite what actual physical gender they have. In so many ways today, we see it in the competition for supplies of masks and PPEs and everything else today. And we sure all want to blame the government, don't we, for what's going on. It's because we're focused on the things of this world. We have a worldly worldview. Jesus is the example of the opposite of that, of having a spiritual worldview. To think about not the things of this world, but the things of God. That His will may be done. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And He came to bear witness to the truth. To the real truth. To God's truth. To the truth of God's love and his forgiveness and his salvation. To see beyond just the things of this world to the eternity that God provides. To know of God's love and his strength and his help. To, to look at our world and to see not just things, but the God who made them. See, not just suffering, but the God who strengthens and heals in the midst of suffering. To see not just death, which our country seems to be so worried about these days again, but to not see just death, but the eternal life that comes after that death through faith in Jesus Christ. When we have those kinds of eyes, when they're not all wrapped up just in ourselves and with the things of this world, but we understand God's perspective. And we see God's hand at work in our lives and in our world. Then we can handle the things of this world in a whole new way. We can handle the suffering, the death, the persecution. We can find for ourselves peace and grace. We can know God's love and God's forgiveness and God's salvation. How do you and I see our world and what's happening around us today? Is it all about ourselves and all about the things of this world? Do we only see the circumstances? Do we only see what we're missing, what we're losing? Is it only about ourselves? Or do we see with spiritual eyes? Do we see God at work? Strengthen, healing, blessing. And do we find our hope in Him? Let's not look just with worldly eyes today. Let's look with the spiritual eyes of Jesus and rejoice in what God is doing. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, the devil, the world, and our sinful nature constantly lead us to worldliness. Forgive 
our worldly sins and grant us the gift of heavenly mindedness so that we might live in the world while not being of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, have mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we join together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining with us today in our worship service. I would like to just inform you concerning our Holy Week services. We will live broadcast this coming Sunday on Palm Sunday at the 8.30 time slot, as we have been doing the last couple of Sundays. We will also live broadcast both our Monday Thursday evening service at 7 and our Good Friday evening service at 7. Both of those will be live broadcast as well. Then on Easter Sunday, instead of having a sunrise service and a later service, we will live broadcast again our Easter Sun Sunday service at 8.30. Not at 10.30 or at 7, which are the times that the other services would have been had we been able to worship in the church. But keeping with the tradition here that we've set up of doing them at 8.30, live broadcast. We will continue to do that on Easter Sunday as well. And so you are invited to join with us for that Easter celebration uh, live broadcast at 8.30 on Sunday. And of course, all of these services will be recorded and downloaded onto both the website and our Facebook page uh, so that you can look at them at a different time if that suits you better. We rejoice in God's blessings at this time. We look forward to celebrating his death and resurrection this holy week. May God be with you. Thank you. Amen.